We're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. I'm glad to be here after three weeks not being able to be here. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Thank you for honoring the Lord through honoring your mass when you came in this morning. Just remember, if you need to walk out, walk out, then, or if you need to walk out to the back lobby, please put it back on. But you are welcome to, to take it off in your place. And let's roll. <laughs> let's not allow our mass to hinder us from worshiping our Lord this morning. When darkness tries, when darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand Chance when I stand in your love. 
still a healer. He's still a miracle worker. He makes a way when there seems to be no way. We've known for a while that Mallory had had a kidney stone. And if you know anything about kidney stones, you know when they're not moving, they're not real painful. Or they're not painful at all usually. But when they are moving, they are extremely painful. Especially at the end. And the last time it was six to eight hours of excruciating pain after days of pain before that. So when I got out of the shower a couple of weeks ago and saw her face contorted in pain, I knew what was going on. So when I went and talked to her, and then I went and was finishing and ready, I was just praying for her. And I felt the Lord say, you, you, you need to pray for her. And I'm like, I am praying for her. No, you need to go lay hands on her. 
So I went and laid hands on her. And I didn't, I didn't remember what, what I prayed for, but she did. That the pain would be gone and the stone would be broken. Within five minutes, the pain was gone. Within two hours, the stone was out of her body, broken in two. Our Lord still heals. He still does miracles. Amen. I've been reminded this past couple of weeks that we've been stuck at home of the old chorus, through it all. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. And you may say, well, I haven't seen his miracles lately. But that song can be a declaration. A declaration that after I walk through whatever I'm walking through, I will be able to say, through it all. Through it all, our Lord was faithful. He walked with me. You know, David said in Psalms 27, that I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Let's stir up our belief. If you're walking through it, stir up your belief as we sing this song together. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word.
life and death are in the power of the tongue. Let's just sing that chorus of that old song one more time. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend. we thank you that you never waste an experience. Lord, on the mountaintops, we rejoice in your goodness and in your lavish grace and blessing. But even in the valley, Lord, we can rejoice that we are learning to trust in Jesus, learning to trust your word, learning to Understand your faithfulness to us all. Learning that never do you leave us, never do you forsake us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sweet, be seated worshipfully as uh, give you the needs here in the body this morning, prayer requests. We have a missionary couple that has been serving in France for many, many years, Manuel and Tina Prabhudas. I believe I pronounced their name somewhat accurately. Uh, they have been working in France for, as I said, a number of years. They're really focusing right now on the planting of churches. Um, Europe is a country that has been very resistant to the gospel for quite a while, but there seems to be an opening, and one of the things that they are praying for is that God would open the doors for great revival in that nation. And specifically, they're asking that through the difficult time that the world is going through, including France, through uh, the economy and COVID-19 and all those things, that uh, God would somehow bring a great harvest of souls. So we're going to be praying for them. We have a good report from Willa Dean. Uh, the biopsy that was concerning her greatly proved to be benign, and so she is rejoicing. Allison Stidham, the mass that is on her kidney is, at this point, uh, they're not too concerned about it. They believe that it's probably not cancerous, uh, but she is dealing with a very, very antibiotic-resistant infection and is asking for our prayers that that infection can be uh, just, cl just cleansed from her body. Uh, we're going to continue to pray against this disease, COVID-19, that is all over our world. And then one of my personal requests is a great harvest of souls. As we see everything that is taking place, we wonder, Lord, how much longer? How much longer, Lord? 
how much longer until you return? I don't know. But it's just caused me again to be praying for the souls of people in my neighborhood, in my family, people that I know in this community. So that's what we're going to pray today. Would you bow your hearts, your heads? Father, we thank you for this couple that have served you faithfully in France. Father, they just finished a cohort where they had 30 church planting teams complete their training who are excited about the possibility of planting 30 brand new churches in the country of France. Lord, we also pray that um, the circumstances that are upon the world through COVID-19, through the economy, would stir the hearts of those who live in France to begin to look back towards Jesus. Years ago, this country acknowledged you as Lord. Very few claim Jesus. And Father, there are a lot who have immigrated to the country from Eastern countries who no longer are Christian, but they could be Islamic or they could be Hindu or other uh, religions. Father, may their eyes and hearts be opened also to the gospel. Father, we praise you for the good report with Willadine, and we praise you for the good report about Allison, that the kidney, uh, the mass on the kidney is, is not something to be concerned about. But now we come before you, Lord, in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we speak defeat to the, to the, uh, uh, the infection that antibiotics are not able to eradicate. With just a word, it can be cleansed from her system. We pray that you do it in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that your spirit would move across this land and that COVID-19 would become a thing of the past, not something that monopolizes our minds, our news channels, and our life. That it would become a thing of the past as you free our world from this pestilence. Father, I pray that also in our community and in this church and using each and every one of us, souls would come to the kingdom. They would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. I pray all of these things in your name because you are the one who invites us to pray and you have invited us to come boldly. And so boldly, we lift these requests in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to transition into a time of reading, reading the word. We're going to be reading from Luke this morning. Reading from Luke's gospel, the ninth chapter. We're going to start at verse one. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. One day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for your journey, he instructed them. Don't talk, don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. Wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their own fate. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the good news and healing the sick. Then Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, heard about everything Jesus was doing. He was puzzled. Some were saying that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. Others thought Jesus was Elijah or one of the other prophets risen from the dead. I beheaded John, Herod said. So who is this man about whom I hear such stories? And he kept trying to see him. We know who this Jesus is, right? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. 
that we know who you are and you know who we are. We are yours, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your word. It is for this day and for this season and for this year. And during COVID-19, it was given to us. We choose to receive your word this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? We're doing good. Um, I am Pastor Evan. Oh, wait. You are doing good. I heard a lot of you. Um, I'm Pastor Evan. I'm the youth and associate pastor here at CFA. You've uh, seen Pastor Rick do prayer, Nathaniel Diener, our worship leader, and his amazing, pa Pastor Rick's amazing wife, Sherry Glowacki. If you have not met us personally, we would love to get to know you. If you catch me, I've been running around quite a bit this morning, but if you catch me, I would love, love to get to know you personally. So feel free to just catch me and say, hey. You know who I am. Um, but if it is your first time here, uh, I just request that you text the word guest to the number 812-577-9959. It'll send you a separate text message asking for some of your information. That is just for us as a church to connect with you. And if you've been here before, uh, you just text the word here to that same number, 812-577-9959. If you are watching online, all that I need you to do is leave a comment down below letting me know that you are excited for the service. If you're watching right now or a week from now, just leave a comment down below letting me know you're here. All right. Thank you guys for being here. Hopefully I get to say hi to some of you. All right. Enjoy this video. I bet you know we're doing something different because we don't normally do it this way with uh, three stools. But this past week, um, Pastor Evan has just been so excited. Of course, he's excited a lot, but this week he's just been so excited and just bouncing around because of some things that are going on, and I wanted to capture that energy. But then Sherry's been kind of excited about things that are going on, so I thought this is a different way of doing announcements, and that is what we're going to do. So they're going to share some of what they're excited about. Now, the first announcement is about a baby shower for, I don't know, let's, Betsy, no, it's not for you, Betsy, <laughs> just teasing. It's for Clarity. Sherry, talk about the baby shower for Clarity. What's going on? So on Saturday at 10 o'clock here at the church, uh, there's going to be a baby shower where we get the opportunity to bless the Ministry of Clarity, which is an incredible ministry. At 10 o'clock, it's a brunch. There's going to be activities. Uh, there is a list of things that Clarity needs that uh, we're asking that you purchase and bless that ministry with those things. Out on the table in the lobby, you can get that list and more information. But Please come, ladies. It's going to be a wonderful time. Again, uh, brunch and activities and a way just 
for us to give of our time and of our resources to bless this ministry. So if you do have any questions, uh, Lori can help you with that. Angie can help you with that. She's downstairs this morning, but she'll be up later. So they can give you more information beyond what I have said. Now, to make it easier on the camera people so they're not swinging the cameras back and forth, I'm going to stay with you here for a second. For the past several months, Sherry has had it on her heart to somehow expand opportunities for the female species of this church to get together more. And so, yeah. Yes, and that's going out online. That's what I said. Yes. So, Sherry, tell us about the things that you have been working on and what's going to be happening with our ladies uh, as far as groups and things. So last year we had one small group, Ladies Loving and Learning, and um, it was a great opportunity to get together, study God's Word, but also it gave us the opportunity to just do some acts of kindness, some acts of love to different people within our congregation, which is why it's called Ladies Loving and Learning. But I really felt... Um, that we needed to expand beyond that. I have had it on my heart for quite a while, really even when Ladies Loving and Learning began, to have a small group for moms. And that's just, it's been in the works, it's been on my heart, but it's just a matter of you know how to do that, when to do that. So I am excited that that is one of the small groups that will be happening on Wednesday night. Uh, Angie Burton will be leading that. Again, normally we do have child care on Wednesday night, so make it easy for the moms, but a way for you to have a small group because there's so many things that are happening during that time in our lives that I think you will be a blessing to each other. I know Angie will be a great blessing to you. So that's happening on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock on a weekly basis. Also, we, there is now going to be, once a month, a small group for you ladies that are home during the day. Some of you, of course, are seniors, but not everyone. And so Betsy uh, and Sandy have grace, uh, gracefully uh, uh, agreed to host that. Actually, it's going to be at Peggy Wampler's home. And once a month, they will be getting together to just connect, to pray for one another, to be a blessing to one another. And so that, again, is happening once a month for those that are available during the day. And the information on when, again, and where is in the, the flyers that are out in the lobby. As we were brainstorming earlier this uh, summer, again, on ways for us as ladies to connect, uh, Kelly Darnell has, has agreed to do a quilting group because they, we don't always have to get together to study God's Word. Fellowship and connecting and... Uh, Moments that we can just pray with one another can be centered around perhaps an interest. And so she loves quilting. Uh, she is going to be hosting once a month, again, a small group for those of you that maybe want to learn how to quilt, those of you that are experienced at quilting, um, just a way to come together. So again, that's, that's one of our sc small groups that is happening. We still have the Ladies Loving and Learning that is happening. So that gives you, again, a variety of ways and times to connect with one another. So I hope you pick one, pick more than one, and get involved. Some, again, like the moms group is once a week. Ladies Loving and Learning is every other week. Uh, the quilting group, and we're calling it Women of Worth, that meet during the day. That's once a month. So again, lots of opportunities for ladies. All right. So... Uh, small groups are one of the big things. Now, Pastor Evan, again, you have had all this excitement all week long, and so now you can let it out. What are Here you excited go. about? Um, well, the, the core reason why we do small groups, and this is what I'm so passionate about. My mic is good. Um, <laughs> small groups is a way for us to connect with one another and grow, grow closer to each other and grow closer to God. And I think at a time, especially... Like today, we need each other and we need to connect with each other. And so um, I was just super excited to get these together. And if you don't know, we have these sheets available out in the lobby. And so you'll see all the different small groups that are available. There should be something for just about everybody. Um, Journey Student Ministries, we are going to still meet. Uh, we're meeting tonight. At, at 6 p.m. and uh, Pastor Tim McNamee also had this fantastic idea to um, have, it's a group, I love the name, you, you create the name, Guitars, God, and a Grill. 
And so while we're doing our youth group, and the Journey Student Ministries, he is going to set up a guitar and he's going to play some music and they're going to grill up some brats. And I'm really jealous. I really want to be there and eat some brats. But that's going to be out in the parking lot. So that's going to be really cool. And the first day is going to be August 30th. Um, another thing is we are starting a young adults group and I am super glad uh, to do that. Mallory Diener is heading that up and it's going to be once a month and so if you guys want to know more information about the different groups there are posters out in the lobby and you can see the information there or pick up one of these sheets. And so in order to sign up, I know last time we did uh, sign up sheets and everybody wrote stuff down. Instead we are now doing this online. And so all you have to do is go to our website columbusfirstassembly.org and it's really simple. There is a, a, a tab right on top it says small groups and it has a lot of the small groups listed there's still more that needed to be added but they will be added this week and we will post that when they're available but all you have to do is click on the group and cl put your name put your phone number and we will get back to you with more information about the group so we are so excited and you can sign up for one group you can sign up for every group you'll probably be really busy if you sign up for every group but you totally can um, but yeah that's what I got all right all right, now, Pastor Tim, did he say it correctly? He got it right. He said guitar. 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 Okay. Because he said guitar the other day. And no, he, he, he made sure that we understood it's, it's a guitar. You know, there's, there's, there's a way of saying that. It's, um, it's going to be a great opportunity. And this is not a group you have to sign up for. It's a group you show up for. Does that, does that make sense? You just show up. And if our neighbors want to show up or people driving down the street want to show up, that's okay. Oh, if you have a guitar. Guitar. Got to say it right now. If you have a guitar, you're supposed to bring it too. Um, and it's just a, it's just a group. It's going to be every other week, uh, every other week out in our parking lot. And so you'll be uh, getting more information about that. But I think it's going to be a great opportunity. And parents, if you're dropping kids off and you just want to hang around and, uh, and sing with uh, Pastor Tim or eat whatever they have. They keep saying brats, so I'm assuming that must be on the that, menu. That's just what I want. Uh, Brats. Oh, it's just what you want. It may not be on the Spice menu. Spicy mustard. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> He's got it. He's got it. Okay. And last thing, and this is this one. Wednesday nights are coming up starting soon, and we have made a major and not so major change to our Wednesday night program. Wednesday night is going to be elective groups for adults. We are no longer going to meet in here. We are going to meet in one of three different classes. Uh, I am teaching a class on current events and how they intersect with the Bible. There's going to be, in fact, you even quoted about life and death and the power of the tongue. There's going to be a group on our words, powerful group. It's a video series by Pastor Robert Morris. The moms are going to meet at that time. The youth are going to meet at that time. The children are going to meet at that time. So Wednesday nights are going to be full classes, no longer a service. So it's going to be class time. And uh, if you are interested in starting a group next time around after the first of the year, let us know if there's something you want to do. But here's the new thing. I've been working on this, and we have just not been able to get it together, going all the way back when Pastor Joel was here. So you can imagine how long ago that was, because he's an old man now, you know. He's got a daughter that's driving. They, in fact, bought her a car, I've just uh, for those of you that uh, follow on Facebook. We are starting Wednesday nights serving food. We are going to have a meal. 6 o'clock, between 6 and 6.30, you can come and eat. And uh, chicken tenders is on the menu. Uh, the second meal, what was the second meal? Oh, my, I forgot. Oh, tacos, yes. So it's chicken tenders, macaroni and cheese, tacos. And then the third week, we're going to have some type of a breakfast casserole. But on Wednesday nights, and there's no charge for this, we'll accept donations to defray some of the costs. But this is for you parents who deal with, as all parents do, People, children coming home from school and you're trying to get a meal on and everything else. You just come to church. We'll take care of the food. We'll take care of the cleanup. You'll eat a nice meal together and then everybody will go to their classes. And then at 8.15, everybody will go home and uh, we'll face Thursday together. So those are the exciting things that are happening here Coming soon is what the uh, graphic says, but uh, I think it's going to be an exciting fall. And one of the things that really excites me is as long as this pandemic continues to impact us, getting together in smaller groups, I think, is going to be so beneficial for our emotional health and our spiritual health. So 
Sign up for a group online. Go to the website. Pick up the flyers. Also in the back are flyers for the uh, Clarity, the, the, the baby shower. There are flyers for the donations that we are getting for our teachers. We give our teachers every year um, a basket of school supplies, and there are still on the back table those little frameable sayings about parenting. And they're for anybody who wants to pick them up. We just uh, printed a whole bunch of them if you want to uh, hang them someplace. So that's all that's going on here. So I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Some The golf outing. Oh. on Randy Bailey's doing it 10 a.m. September 26 which is my birthday but also I want to remind you guys today is Bryce Neely's birthday so be sure to tell him happy birthday today okay all right let's move on to the next thing go ahead and run that video Two weeks ago, I spoke about how we can experience and live in God's peace. And I thought it was a one-shot message. You know, I thought that the, what the Holy Spirit put on my heart was good. But after I preached the message and over the past couple of weeks, I felt the gentle tug of God to take it one step farther. And that's what we're going to do today. It is my personal belief that there is a hunger inside every person to live in peace. There is a hunger inside every one of us to live in peace. And when that peace isn't there, we long for it. We long for completeness. We long for fulfillment. We long for peace. There is a hunger inside of us. And do you know, God understands that hunger and has made it available. Listen to the words of Jesus from John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Do you know that Jesus has left you and I with a gift? That gift is available. Have you received his gift, peace of mind and heart? And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And then Paul talking about the issue of peace in the book of Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all that he has done. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. God's peace is available. In fact, here's uh, one of my key thoughts this morning. It is God's will for his children to experience and live in peace. I highlighted two words. It is God's will for his children, that's you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is us this morning, it is God's will for you this morning to experience and then live in. It's not to be a one-time experience or an occasional thing, it's to be a place that we live. It is God's will for his children to experience and live in his peace. But the second key thought that is um, uh, putting these messages together is this, as it comes up on the screen. Biblical peace 
is a byproduct of doing other things. In the first week when I preached this two weeks ago, I said, don't pray for peace. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with praying for peace, but most of us are praying for something that God says is acquired in another way. Peace is a byproduct of doing other things. So I'm going to briefly review some of my uh, key thoughts, and then I'm going to get into the content today. Biblical peace is far more than the absence of stress or the absence of pressure. You can actually be at peace in the middle of tension, stress, and the feelings of, of chaos or feelings of being overwhelmed by what's going on in our culture. Sometimes you and I are not living in peace because of the circumstances around us and our focus on those circumstances, but sometimes you and I are not living at peace because of the emotional and relational pain which we are currently experiencing or have experienced in our past. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Sometimes you and I are not living at peace because of the emotional and relational pain which you are currently experiencing or have experienced in the past. You can experience and live in God's peace in the middle of pain. And so that's why I've entitled the message this morning, Scarred, but finding peace in your pain. Scarred, finding peace in your pain. I don't believe there is a person on planet Earth. Maybe there is. I just don't believe that there are. There is a person on planet Earth that does not have some internal scarring, some wounds that have come about from our past the life that we have lived, what people have done, what people have not done. And so we get scarred and we have pain. We have relational pain. We have emotional pain. We have, some of us have pain of rejection, uh, pain of abuse. I don't believe that any person can escape this life without emotional pain and the scars it leaves behind. But the good news this morning is you can experience and live in God's peace in the middle of pain. And so I want to take you back to the key verse that I am preaching from, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. If you can find it in your paper Bible, just so that you can underline it, you can highlight it, you can dog ear the page, whatever it is, it's up on the screen. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Do you hear what it says? You, and that you is God. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Now, throughout this past couple of weeks, there were three words, three key words that I believe the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart that I'm going to focus on today. They're not the only words why we have a lack of peace in our hearts, but the three words are these, bitterness, unforgiveness, and offense. Bitterness, unforgiveness, and offense. Hear me. You cannot live in God's peace fully if you live in bitterness, unforgiveness, or hold on to offenses. You will not live, you will not experience and live in God's peace if in your heart is bitterness, unforgiveness, and offenses. These things will rob you of God's peace. The minds and hearts of many people, even God's people, are often in turmoil. And they'll get a season of reprieve uh, for a, a minute or two or a day or two or even a week or two. But we fall back into this place because of what resides within us, the many things that have impacted us emotionally or relationally. So, since it is not God's will for us to live this way, it is his will for us to experience and live in perfect peace, let's take a look once again at what this perfect peace is and how to achieve it. The Hebrew word for peace is the uh, word shalom, and it is a word that has a very broad meaning. It doesn't just mean peace. It actually can mean peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. It means all of those, and one author said it is actually all of those combined. The Hebrew word shalom is almost impossible to translate into English properly because it has so much 
nuance in its meaning, but it is really wholeness and completeness and welfare. And in Isaiah 26, the Bible says that you, meaning God, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. As I mentioned to you two weeks ago, and you can certainly listen to that message, it's online, perfect peace is the way that the English translators translated shalom, shalom. Because in the Hebrew, it says God will keep in shalom, shalom, those who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Two words, the same word back to back. And in English, the best way that they were able to capture what this uh, passage of Scripture is trying to communicate is to call it perfect peace. But basically, it is shalom, shalom. Where God wants you to live, where God wants me to live, is in perfect peace, in shalom, shalom. So how do we get there? Remember, I said that perfect peace is a result of something else. It's in the verse. Perfect peace is a result of us trusting in God and keeping our thoughts fixed on Him. Perfect peace is a result of trusting in God and fixing our thoughts on Him. This is the supernatural key to living in 2020. To live in 2020 with all of the uncertainty and with all of the chaos and with all of the things that are taking uh, that are happening in our world, the supernatural key to living in 2020 in perfect peace is doing what Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says. And the supernatural key to living in peace in your pain and to have peace in your scars is also here in Isaiah 26 3. So here's one of my points this morning. Perfect peace is yours when you continually trust God and keep your thoughts fixed on Him. Perfect peace is yours when you continually trust God and keep your thoughts fixed on Him. I highlighted the word continually because I think most of us can occasionally, most of us from time to time can get ourselves focused in on God and trusting God but perfect peace is ours when we continually trust God and keep our thoughts fixed on Him. Subpoint, actually two statements coming up on the screen. If you continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, perfect peace will come. If you fail to continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, the promised perfect peace will elude you. You may have some non-stressed out days, but many, many, many of them will not be. You may have some non-painful days, but many, many, many of them will not be because the key to experiencing and walking in God's perfect peace is to continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities. So the question is this. What are you focused on? When you are not really monitoring your thinking, what are you focused on? What are your thoughts fixed on. Two weeks ago, we talked about how it is very uh, common nowadays that our thoughts would be fixed on our problems. Our thoughts would be fixed on uh, the, the world situation. Our thoughts would be fixed on the financial situation. Our thoughts may be fixed naturally on our job and its security or lack thereof, on our income, whether we're in uh, having unemployment right now. There's a lot of things that can be impacting our thoughts, external circumstances, but if that's all we're thinking about, and I'm just going to drop this thought out there, if that's all you're listening to, some of you would help your peace by shutting off your internet and staying off of the feeds and staying off of the news feeds. Some of you would help your peace if you would turn off Fox News or CNN or NPR or whatever your favorite news source is. But you've got it on and you're constantly feeding into yourself, which is causing your mind to fix on these things. There was an interesting poll. It was on the Internet. It's got to be true, right, if it was on the Internet, right? Right? Okay. That's good preaching. <laughs> I wish I had the time to have verified it. 
But I guess a poll was done amongst Americans and amongst those around the world as to how many people have actually contracted COVID-19 and how many people have actually died from the disease. And according to this, which is on the internet, which absolutely has to be true, right? You go verify it for me. But I thought it was fascinating that in supposedly this poll that was taken, 20 per, Americans as a whole say about 20% of the population has caught it and 9% has died. And it's actually a little over 1% of the population has caught it and only 0.4% have actually died. Why would we say 20% have caught it? And actually, in other places around the world, the, the percentages were higher, according to this thing that was on the Internet, which we know is true. And since I'm quoting it, which is also going to be on the Internet, I've just given some credibility to it. Here's why I use that example. Because it monopolizes the news. It monopolizes social media. It monopolizes our thoughts. And because it's monopolizing our thoughts... Our heart is fixed there, and so we think that the repercussions of it are possibly worse than they are. Now, I still don't like the fact that some people have died from this. Uh, maybe one of your loved ones has been sick. Some of you have told me horrendous stories about people that you know that have had the disease and recovered from the disease. Some of you yourself, you've had your own experience with COVID-19. And uh, from what I hear, it wasn't a pleasant experience. But at the same time, because of the focus that has been given and the fact that our lives have been impacted to the, the fact that after I finish preaching and when I go to praying for folks, I will have a mask on. Uh, when I'm out in the lobby, I have a mask on. Because of the focus that has been given to this, I think many people feel that its impact, if this poll, which is on the internet, which we know is correct and true and everything that's out there, if this poll is correct, we could see just a subtle way of how the focus on something actually causes it to appear larger than it is. If you continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, perfect peace will come. But if you fail to continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, the promised perfect peace will elude you. So this week, I want to talk about something that I think is far too common in way too many people's lives. It is very difficult to control. I will share a personal illustration of this at the close of my message. But we're going to talk about things like bitterness, unforgiveness, and offense. See, what you are fixed on will impact how much peace you experience. What you are fixed on will impact how much peace you will experience. And if you're fixed on these things, if you're fixed on offense, rejection, hurt, abuse, uh, being taken advantage of, or being overlooked in some way, could you bring those words up, please? If you are fixing and focusing on these things, it will impact the amount of peace that you will feel. The Bible says offenses will come, but there's a difference between an offense and being offended. Being offended is a choice. There will be hurts, there will be rejection, there will be abuses of some type. You will be taken advantage of. And if you're young enough like some of these up here in the front row and yet you have not yet been taken advantage of, I will guarantee it will happen at some point in your life. Somebody will take advantage of you and it hurts when they do. You'll be overlooked for something. And because of that, if we're not careful, it gets into our minds and it gets into our hearts and our mind and our heart will gravitate towards that. It will fixate on it. And this is why God is telling us that if we're going to live in perfect peace, we have to choose to trust him and choose to fix our thoughts on him continually. I don't know who I'm speaking to today. Just everybody give me your attention because I want to talk very specifically to someone or someone's here or possibly someone that's watching online today. Somebody or several bodies 
your workplace has caused many of the things that are on the screen. You've been offended at work. You've been taken advantage of at work. You've been overlooked at work. Maybe you've been overworked at work. Um, you feel abused at work. Uh, you feel misunderstood at work. Uh, you have felt rejection at work. And, and what I felt the Holy Spirit just gently say to me is, watch out. Watch out. You're losing your peace. You're losing your peace because, and this is, make, this is why it makes it very hard. You have to go to work tomorrow. And when you go to work tomorrow, you're going to put yourself in the environment where the pressure and the offense and the abuse and the feelings of rejection, maybe somebody stepped over you or on top of you to climb the ladder and you get there and now they're your supervisor and maybe you were better qualified. And every time that you walk in the door of the place where you are employed, the fixation and the focus is on your hurt or on what took place. Be careful, because you will not be able to live in this perfect peace, this shalom, shalom that God has, if you can't release those things. And we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But I just wanted to say that there's somebody or more than one here who is dealing with some work-related issues. And during this time when work is kind of rough on a lot of people, it is easy to let this stuff lodge in our heart. And then what we do is at work, we're focused on it. After work, we're focused on it. Before we go to bed, we're focused on it. Sometimes we're focused on it in our dreams. Have you ever woke up from one of those dreams that has been just <laughs> um, fueled by work? And then when you get up the next day, the one thing that you have to do is you have to go to work and then you're fixed again. You will keep it perfect peace those who trust you and whose thoughts are fixed on you. We need to fix our thoughts. Fix our thoughts. Fix our thoughts on our Lord and on God. A couple of passages regarding forgiveness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Notice it says refuse to. There are some people that actually have refused to forgive. And if our Father will not forgive our sins at that point, that will, point, that will take away some peace. I don't know exactly how to interpret this passage, what that means. There's a lot of interpretation, but this is just Jesus' words. If you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you. And then in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, the Apostle Paul says... Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. We don't have any exception or excuse. Just as God in Christ has forgiven us. How did God forgive me? Totally and completely, freely. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it, as we sing in the one song. He has totally and completely forgiven me. That's the way he wants us to forgive others. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And then two passages, just briefly, on offense. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. If you want to foster love in relationships, if you want to foster love on the job, cover over the offense. And then in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, a person's wisdom yields patience, and it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Offenses will come. Will you choose to overlook them? Will you foster love by covering over an offense? It's tough. So how do we forgive? How do we wrestle out of this bitterness? How do we not become offended even if we receive offense? So I'm just going to briefly go through a few things here, and then I'll tell you a, a personal story. The first thing I want to tell you is you got to do it one day at a time. One day at a time. You forgive today. Forgive today. 
one day at a time. I think I'll just camp on the work thing before you go to work on Monday. Whoever or whatever the situations are that you are dealing with that are causing you to lose your peace, on Monday, you go in already having forgiven them. And then maybe when you pull in the parking lot of your place of employment, you forgive again. Because as soon as you get there, you may feel the emotion rise. When you walk in and you're doing pretty good, the perfect peace is there, the shalom, shalom is there, and then out of the corner of your eye, you see that person. I don't know who they are. You do. You forgive again. One day at a time, one bit of forgiveness at a time. Forgive and then forgive again and forgive again. Forgive the offense, forgive the oversight, forgive the rejection, the hurt, the abuse, whatever it is. And then when you see or you feel bitterness coming up, when you feel the offense coming up again, okay? Here's my second suggestion. Cry out to God. You need his help. He is not at all offended that you would cry out to him and say, God, I need help. I don't want to live bitter. I don't want to live unforgiving. I don't want to live with this offense. I need your help. Cry out to God. Pray to him and say, help me, God. I don't want to miss out on your perfect peace. Cry out to him. Cry out to him for help to obey his commands. He says, forgive. He says, um, as God in Christ forgave us, he says, forgive. God, help me to do that. I can't do that naturally. None of us can do it naturally, but he can give you the supernatural strength to do it. And then, as you forgive and as you work through this, trust God with the results. Trust God with the results. It is very probable that the person who did whatever it was to you, okay, does not deserve to be forgiven. But forgiveness is never deserved. Forgiveness is a gift that we offer just as it was offered to us. They actually may have stepped over you and on you consciously and purposely. They saw you as a weak link and they saw it to where they wanted to go and they did it purposely. They don't deserve to be forgiven, but that is not what the Bible says for us as children of God that we need to do. That person who left you, that person who rejected you, that person who didn't follow through on what they said they would do, swearing on a stack of Bibles, still needs to be forgiven. They don't deserve it. But we do it because our God has commanded us to do it. And then we need to trust God with the results. Reverend Chris Beal said this, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, you may want to take a picture of this. Uh, we don't have note sheets now, or I would have had it in a note sheet to you. But I, I think that his understanding of forgiveness is so key. When you apply forgiveness one day at a time, one remembrance at a time, what happens to you, or excuse me, what happened to you will no longer be an emotion. It will only be a fact. When you apply forgiveness one day at a time, one remembrance at a time, what happened to you will no longer be an emotion. It will only be a fact. That's when you know that you have pressed through and you're breaking through the prison of unforgiveness and bitterness. When you can think about the issue and now it's a fact and no longer an emotion. And that happens when you forgive, you apply forgiveness one day at a time, one remembrance at a time. Charles F. Glassman says this, forgiving someone may cost you your pride, but not forgiving them will cost you your freedom. And it will certainly cost you your peace. I knew a believer many years ago who cried out to God all the time for peace and, and, and wholeness in their life. And they were constantly seeking God that he would open these things up to them. But as I got to know them, I saw and experienced from time to time this rush of yuck <laughs> that would come out of them that was tied to old hurts and unforgiveness and bitterness and it became very apparent to me 
why they lacked what they kept crying out to God for, peace, wholeness, security. Because what they wanted was the result of something else. And they did try to focus and fix their thoughts on God. They spent great amounts of time in God's word. They spent great amounts of time in prayer. But what was blocking their ability to live in the perfect peace was a heart that did not release and could not release the wounds from the past. Now, I'm not going to be trite this morning. I've heard some people that would say when you have a hurt or when you have an offense or when there's something going on in your life, just let it go. In fact, I think some of them would like to sing the Frozen song. Let it go. You know, just let it go. Or they're not worth it. You know, where they're trying to just let you just get rid of it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you something trite like that. It is hard to let it go. In fact, you need supernatural help to let it go. You need God's way of letting it go. Forgiveness every day, maybe multiple times a day. Because when something gets inside of me, it comes up again and again and again and again. And when I think I've let it go, there it is again. And when it comes up, it's like I can't stop thinking about it. Any of you thought about um, a chocolate donut yet today? Any of you thought about one? Now you have. And guess what? You'll think about it from now till probably tonight. Why? You weren't thinking about it. But see, that's what happens to me. When all of a sudden the memory comes back or the, the thing, then all of a sudden I can't not think about it. There was a situation uh, Sherry and I experienced many, many, many years, decades ago. I hadn't thought about this for a long time. And all of a sudden, boom, the thought came back. I don't know why the thought came back. I don't know what reminded me of the situation. But for the rest of the day, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It's not easy to let these things go. That's why you can't let it go. You have to attack them. You have to focus and fix yourself on God and God's solution. You have to trust him by forgiving and forgiving and releasing and praying and praying. The way to stop is to fix yourself on God. Friday, just a couple of days ago, an offense came into my mind and my thoughts. I dismissed it because I had other things to do. And as soon as I had that moment when my mind wasn't fixed on something, it was back. It came up a few times. I began to see my mind going towards that offense, going towards those feelings that I had. So what did I do? I prayed. I forgave again, and I refused to fix my thoughts on that situation and that offense. I was going to forgive, and I was going to pray. Then on Saturday, it wanted to come up again, maybe just so that I could give you an illustration on Sunday morning as to what I dealt with on Friday and Saturday. On Saturday, it wanted to come back up again, the offense, the situation, the hurt. And what I started to do, uh, again, I forgave, I fixed my thoughts on God. I started to play, pray God's blessing upon that person. I just started to pray God's blessing upon that person, and I desired that they would discover how to become incredible in God. Because most of us cannot just let go. We have to, get, we have to work very hard in releasing, forgiving, submitting ourselves for healing. Praying blessing is just one of the ways that it helps me. You just say, God, you've got this. I want them to become incredible men, women of God, whoever they may be. Maybe it's going back to work. Maybe it's a supervisor. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe they're not even believers. Can you pray God's blessing upon them that they would find Jesus? that they would find their own forgiveness, that they would find healing and wholeness in their life? Would you pray those blessings on people? What happens is the emotion of your own hurt begins to dissipate. It's a way to get yourself from fixing on that 
the fixing on God. Remember what Isaiah said. You will keep in perfect peace those who trust you. You've got to trust God's method. Forgiveness and blessing and release. Those who trust you, whose thoughts are fixed upon you. Keep your thoughts fixed on God. Keep your heart full of the things of God. The word of God. Prayer. The promises of God. And see what God would do. Because for the most part, we just can't let something go. Really, we can't. If it got inside of you, you just can't let it go. And it's not a good idea to push it down. You need to walk through God's process. Because remember... It is God's will for you to experience, but this is the words, and live in his perfect peace. It is God's will for you to experience and live in shalom, shalom. And it is possible. God doesn't make a promise. That is not possible. And I don't think it's difficult from the standpoint that it's going to take a horrendous amount of emotional energy but it will take some obedience and it will take bearing some pride and it will take a lot of forgiveness. We need to fix our thoughts on God. So whether you're fixing your thoughts on external circumstances or internal pain, you need to turn your thoughts and fix them on God. For more help in this area, I'm just going to re re reference two resources. Uh, one is a Jimmy Evans book called When Life Hurts. And the second is an older book that has been in my library for several decades. I've read it, I believe, personally three to four times, and I recommend it to many, Healing for Damaged Emotions. Both of these books will be helpful because the journey of freedom from the inner hurts, the rejections, the deep wounds, and I am not trying to gloss over some people, maybe even some of you, have such deep wounds that you're not even sure you want to go there. But God says, yes, I want you to go there with me. Because there is a place of peace. There is a place of blessing that God wants you to go to, but it can only be achieved as you follow his path, as you trust him, and as you fix your thoughts on him. As the team makes their way back to the platform, would you bow your heads with me today? Lord, that promise in Isaiah 26 is so appealing that you're going to keep us in perfect peace. You will keep us in perfect peace as we trust in you and as we fix our thoughts on you. God, in Jesus' name, I pray that something that I say today would lodge into the heart of each person who needs what I'm talking about and that that will be their starting point. Their starting point of walking through this journey, of finding shalom, shalom, perfect peace. We love you, Lord, and we appreciate you. Your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you that Jesus loves us so much that he made it available to us. He said, I leave you a gift peace, not as the world gives, but as he gives, so this gift can be ours, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. I specifically ask the team this morning to lead us in a song. The words of this song minister to me, and I hope they minister to you. Would you stand as they lead us? Lord, I need you.
For a final prayer, and then I'm going to open the front. Specifically this morning, I want to pray for individuals who say, Jesus, I, I, I need help in this area. I need a supernatural ability to begin to walk the path that you wish me to walk. And I think as we cry out to God, he's going to hear that cry. You're not trying to avoid walking it. You're just saying, I need help to walk this path. 
And so I want to pray over you. I want to lay hands upon you, speak over you in the name of Jesus. But if that's you this morning, you just would say, Pastor, there's just, there's just junk that goes way back. And when you talk about this perfect peace, when you talk about peace that goes beyond understanding, I, I, I think that's got to be for other people because it couldn't be for me. Yes, it could. Yes, it could. With God's help and with your willingness to walk the path, yes, it can. Lord, I don't know who this individual is today that, or individuals, Lord, that, that need this touch. And it could be someone that's at home and they're saying, oh, I wish I could be there with Pastor, that he could lay hands on me, but unfortunately I can't. But they can cry out to you in their home. Lord, identify people that you have a special endowment this morning of release and power in their life from the wounds and the pains and that they can, with your help, walk through the process of finally some of these memories no longer being an emotion, but only being a fact, only being an event. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. As we dismiss, just want to remind you again that uh, we don't receive offerings like we used to by passing a bag, but if you've brought your tithe or your offering with you today, there are baskets in the back. Many of you are uh, going on to the online type of a thing, the e-giving. We appreciate that. You can, um, you can give through our Give Plus app. You can give text, in church, or, uh, text to give, and then you can give on our website. Or if you're just old school and forget to bring it, put it in the mail. Uh, the postal service at this point is still working. Uh, <laughs> and mail is still arriving here. Maybe not as fast as we would like. God bless you. So glad that you could be here online. Those of you, you're, you're our extended family. Uh, you, you are at home for a variety of reasons during this time. Some of you, it's just impossible for you to be in church here just because of physical condition, or maybe uh, you live way outside. I don't know where, where everybody lives that logs on online. But for those of you that can't be here, you are still our family. You're part of the extended family. You can be part of a small group if, if you don't want to get out in a mass of people and just want to get out where there's a small group meeting, you can sign up for those small groups also. Just go to our website and find that page that Pastor Evan talked about that you could sign up for small groups. The rest of you, God bless you. If you desire prayer, I'll be donning my mask and I would love to pray over you this morning. Thank you guys so much for joining us today at CFA. I hope that you enjoyed the message prepared by Pastor Rick. Now, if you have any questions determining uh, your relationship with Christ or whether you want to give your life to Christ or maybe you have prayer requests, please contact us here at the office. You can always contact us at office at columbusfirstassembly.org. You can send us a message through Facebook Messenger or you can leave a comment down below either on YouTube or on Facebook. You can text us at the number 812-577-9959 and we may not get back to you right away, but we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Now, if this service has blessed you in any way and you would love to share that with your friends and family, we would be super excited for you to do that because we want the Word of God to be known to as many people as possible. So thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you next week.